sort of showing. Um, you really actually in this problem, you don't need a positive. Uh, I just did this kind of for visual purposes where I'm going to do generalizes to any A. Um, now, before I get started on this, I am going to record something that we're going to see today. So here's a trick. <laughs> One that I suspect many of you have seen. Uh, I'm just going to tap one half of sign of 10 plus one half of theta over sign of How many of you have ever seen this trick? I didn't. This is not one that you're going to learn. Uh, you can actually derive this from scratch, uh, but it helps to know this famous identity here. How many of you have ever seen this? Where here I is the square root of negative. This is a very famous identity. E, the I theta is cosine theta is cosine theta, the rise is very big one. You will have to be able to verify this in some way. But if you use this, you can derive this thing up here from here. So you can just take that identity here in red as something that was given to you from on high that just called. Okay, so I want to work this definite integral out, and this is why I made a positive so we can kind of picture it. We have cosine theta going like this. Here. What am I going to do? I'm going to break this interval up into a whole bunch of little boxes. This. The width of each box. What's the length of my interval? Total length. From zero to A. Just A. So if I divide it up into N boxes, the width of each box is going to be what? A over N. Everybody agree with that? And the right end point. Of K. So the interval is zero plus boom over k widths. So the Riemann sum to approximate this. is this thing right here, k equals one to n. Plug the right endpoint into your function. And the width of each interval is like this. Everybody okay with that? Now let me Massage this a little bit. Let me write this coming down explicitly. Notice this has a factor of A over N. Let's we'll see, K equals one. This is cosine 
A over N. K equals two. This is cosine two A over N. K equals three. This is the cosine three A over N. I did just before I'm the cosine N yeah. A over N. what the sum is. Now, at this point, anybody see anything we can use to help us move on with our lives? Here, we've got this thing helping us out here. What's the role of theta over here? It's A over N. So let's apply this formula. This is theta here. Okay. So according to my formula, this should be minus a half. plus one half sine of n plus one half theta, which is a over n, over sine one half a over n. So all I did here is I used my formula, my nifty little formula that I got, uh, from trig, and I replace my theta by A over N. Okay, okay so let me uh, work this out just a little bit more. This is A over N times minus a half. This is going to be plus a half sign of this is going to be a plus a over two then over sign uh one half a This is minus a over two p plus a over two p times sine a plus a over two p sine. One this is my approximate area, right? And it's a mess. How do I get this exact? What do I do now? So now that I get my Riemann sum, my approximate area, what do I do here to get the exact answer? Right. Okay. So then that thing goes to infinity minus a over two n. A uh, sign A plus A two N over sign one
gosh, this is confusing a little bit to me. Uh, let's look at this just piece by piece. Where is A over two men going? The same goes to infinity. Just this chunk hanging out here. This one's going to zero. And so A over two n is going to zero. What's happening here? What, the numerator of this fraction is going to what? Well, that piece is going to zero, so it's just going to sign A. The denominator is going to sign of zero. So this is zero here, zero here. This is all A. We can straight up use all the calls rule if you want, but I'm going to show you how to do a trick that is sometimes okay. Uh, I don't know if you all ever do this with any words. This is useful. Let's let theta be A over N. So everywhere I see an A over N, I'm going to replace it with theta. So now we have limit this is minus one half theta. Right? Because that A over N is just theta. This is one half theta. This is sine of A plus theta. Uh, actually, this is A plus one half theta. Bill? And I get sine of A plus one half theta. Okay. Before I move on, everybody see where I got the theta replacing an A over N. So this is one half A over N is theta. This is one half A plus A plus one half theta, and that's one half theta. Everybody okay with all Now, here's my question. There is no more N. Where's theta go? If n is going to infinity, where is theta going? Zero. Zero. And I think you'll find that this is a much easier limit to work out. Uh, because here, the n is in the denominator, which makes local calls a little obnoxious. Okay, so let's take this apart. This limit, that piece goes to zero. Let me dissect this one. This is lim as theta goes to zero. This is uh, sine times lim theta goes to zero, one half theta over sine. And all I did is I just took this apart. Separate limit here and separate limit here. And this is that old trick that I used, but really this is the zero over zero part. That's going to zero, that's going to zero. This is going to sign it, it's minus zero. What happens in this limit? Well, this is sine A. Oh, Theta is going to zero. And this is, I can use what we call for, right? Theta is What's the derivative of one half theta? One half. So the derivative of sine of one half theta is cosine one half theta times the derivative of what's inside, which is one half. So if I plug in, I get. One half over one half is one sine a. So the area under this curve here is exactly sine a. That's a really neat short answer, and I never want to do this again. Right? This is complicated. And it depended on the fact that I happen to know that trig I didn't do that I first looked at. Cosine theta is cosine theta, blah, blah, blah. 
I can't expect to reinvent that kind of wheel every time there's a problem. So the map we are doing is a lost cause unless we can find a better way. And today I am here to be your savior in that regard because there is a better way. And this is the fundamental theory. This is the centerpiece. This is why we study capital. Oh, this is one of the main reasons we study capital. First, I have to start off with an area of motion. Associated to as uh, okay, so let me draw you kind of a picture of it. I hope I'll paint a portrait of what we're doing here. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll work some numerical some of these. And this area of function looks like I've kind of had a little stroke here. I'm off on some kind of tangent. However, this is going to be central to um, what's going on with the fundamental theorem of calculus. So, what is this area of function all about? Well, if I have my original function, let's say you know, it's t axis. Call this T. And I have this new function. A is fixed. And this area here is A. So what this area function does. Is it? It's a measuring stick, and when I say area, I mean loosely because that function could be negative. It's actually a signed area or a net area, so it's area above minus area below. So, what a of x does is it says take my function f, that's the root, and measure my area from a to x. That's what this does. So, um, the way I've drawn this function here, what, what, well, in any case, what should A, a little A be? What happens when I measure the area from A to itself? It should be zero, interval from zero to zero, uh, the interval from A to A to zero. Notice the way I draw this, if X is bigger than A, well, this is over short range, this should be positive. Right? If, what if X is on this side? What if X is over here? Integrate from A to X, you're going backwards, and you've got a positive area, it should be negative. So, let's we'll see. So let me draw this curve this way. Um, this is crosses the axis to the two. So, 
here. So this is for example uh, two or four. Um, what happens if I measure here? Like, right? so let's figure out the value here. What is a a zero? That measures the area from zero to itself. That's a zero. What's a at one? Well, it should measure this trapezoid, right? You agree with that? So let's see. It should be basically that rectangle plus that triangle. Now, this triangle is too tall, one wide. So this triangle has area one, and the rectangle has area, uh, I guess, two. So this is three. This should be this area here, half the base times twenty. Make the triangle. Uh, the width is two. I is four, so that's what you think. What if it's somewhere between there? Let's see if we can do something like I, I only measure this in three places. What happens if it's like right here? Well, this would be the point A, uh, 4 minus 2A. Agreed. So if it were right here, I'm assuming A is between 0 and 2. This rectangle is, we'll see it's A, Y. And it's 4a minus 2i, or 4 minus 2a, and then you've got this triangle here, and this triangle here uh, is also a y, and how tall is it? How tall is it? It's this y coordinate minus uh, this block, right? So it should be, so it's a triangle, so it should be one half the base times the height, which is four minus four minus two A. So what do I get? I get four A minus two A squared plus two A, well, actually smarter than me, like this is this is two a and this is a squared. So actually, as it turns out. You get lucky because this one will always be. Uh, no, let's check this on what we've done so far. If you plug in A equals zero, you get zero. So that works. You plug in B equals 
put in eight is going to be four minus one is three. You put eight is two, plug in eight minus four is four. Okay, good. Uh, let's check it actually here. See if this one still works. What is a of four? What do you get? Does that make sense? If you use this formula, you should get 16 minus 16 is zero. Does that make sense? Because this triangle here perfectly cancels this one. Look at A of 3. What does my formula get? 12 minus 9 is 3. What happens here? Well, now you've got the triangle that we had here. Triangle is 4. And this triangle right here is uh, 1. 4 minus 1, which is hanging under, is 3. It turns out that this formula always works. And that's what the area function is. It just measures it. Uh, by the way, what happens here? What is A minus Five. Let's see why that's true, why that should be true, or why that makes sense. Let's extend this this way. This is, um, let's see, this is the point minus one, and it should be what? Six, right? Perfect. So let's measure the area of this. This has length one, this has height four, so this rectangle is four. This has height two and width one, so this has area one. So I get a total area of five. Why is it negative? You're measuring backwards. Okay. Everybody okay? So this is making sense to me. Let me do one more gut check on this. What happens? It's very, what's the derivative of that? Four minus two negative. Well, we're familiar. Very much like this, isn't it? This is not a coincidence. Okay, so this is what we call the area. What it, what it measures is the net area, given the appropriate direction. Um, we did this as well here. <clears throat> Here's another example. I won't go into a great deal of detail because we already kind of went through this, but what we did earlier is found the integral from zero to x cosine p to p is sine x. That was a first problem. Right? So what this tells me is this area, at least up until you hit power two, but it actually it's always worked, sine x at one area of the curve. What is the derivative of sine x? Yeah, not as well as this. So let's uh. Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 1. 
I'm going to use this for part two. Well, fundamental theorem of calculus one is uh, important in the following sense. It gives you another whole class of functions to deal with once it can be represented as numbers. Uh, it shows the connection with that in the original function, and it is important to use uh, this to uh, show the fundamental theorem of calculus what to do, which is what you're going to use mostly on a day to day basis. If F um, F is continuous on a unit from A to B, then the function, this area function that we just talked about, A of X of F T T is continuous on a b differentiable on a. and what is more a prime of x is f of x so a of x, a of x is antiderivative of f of x on the minimum page. Um, You've seen this by example. So, for example, so that's the next thing to square. I don't know if you all remember this, but back when we were in pre nine, we talked about antiderivatives. I told that you all, that any of, any of you that could write down an antiderivative could just walk out of the class and do that, right? Because you can't write it down in terms of ordinary, uh, what they call elementary functions, science logs, and composing them to square roots, roots, and things like so forth. You can't do it with composition going in the But the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that you can write it in terms of So f of x. Is the interval from zero of x of e of the t squared of t, then f prime of x. So, in other words, and this antiderivative is used in a number of good and a number of unfortunate ways. Um, So, I'll turn to the example here. Minus g of x is e to the minus x squared. Anybody know where the importance of this one e to the minus x squared? Here's an antiderivative of this. Here's what this thing looks like. I think I know what this is called. This is called bell curve. It's used a lot in probability and statistics. Uh, it's used to sort of measure things like, you know, what's the average person's weight, what's the standard deviation, what percentage of the population. This many pounds, this many pounds, uh, various things involved in statistics of population. And to compute, like for example, if you ever took the SAT or took some kind of standardized test or whatever, and they say what percentile is, what they're doing is they're computing an area under this curve. It's 
x. So when they give you some percentile thing based on whatever test score you took or what your percentile is, what your blood sugar is, or anything like that, what they're doing is they're measuring their and that's helpful. So this is very important. This antiderivative function comes up in a very important way. Okay. Um, every example that we've seen is like this. Let's see why this is true. Um, this is very important here. And then I'm going to give you a generalization. Uh, I want to prove, so I can, I can get to all I really need to do is, excuse me, all I really need to do is prove that the derivative of this is that that's because if that's true, that means that this function is differentiable because there's this derivative, uh, and not only that, it's a derivative is continuous, and the same case continuous as well. So really, this is the crux of the matter. If I get this, then I get the continuity and differentiability. So really, we only have to show. That a prime of x is a prime. So now, what is a prime of x? At this point, I've got no choice but to go all school and just write down what a prime of x is. And we're going to use some of our proper examples that we learned last time to help us out. With them. So. At least I can sort out by showing my instructor that I know what the definition of the derivative is. Limit is h goes to zero of a x plus h times a x over. Everybody okay with that? That's what this is. And then I'm going to do a couple steps on the way. At this point, I'm just going to move on with my life by plugging in. Okay, I know what a of x is. It's this. X. That's what a of x is. What's a of x plus h? Well, everywhere I see an x, I put in an x plus h. And I only see it in one place. And there you go. Anybody see any way that we can simplify this? This might be a little difficult to see. But in my first step, I really I want to turn that into a plus. Anybody see a way I can turn that into a plus by manipulating this thing? There you go. We do we always do that, right? So So my other piece is the same. Well, I'm going to turn that to a plus, and I do that by, as you say, putting that up. Reversing the, reversing the order of the equation. So see that? Turn that around. There you go. Now that I've done that, you see anything else that I can do to compactify this? You better see how I can write this as a single number. Instead, I've got two numbers. You better see how I can write it as one. Well, eventually we're going to do that, but think about what we're doing. We're going from x to a, then we're going from 
paid at the stage. There you go. Was actually, believe it or not, we're near the end of the year. Here's my function. Now, what we're doing here, we're now going to S. S plus H. And remember, this is getting very, very tiny. Age of this. Now, let me kind of give you the kind of the intuitive feel for this. Okay. I, here, I want to say a little swap, and then I'm going to kind of fill in. As H gets very distinct and small, so imagine that the red one, X is fixed, and you're sliding that red one closer and closer to X. What is this shape under the curve? Look more and more like. It looks more and more like a rectangle, doesn't it? Or maybe it maybe a trapezoid, perhaps. But on a small enough interval, that's almost a straight line, so it looks almost like a trapezoid. Everybody agree with that? And what happens when I take sort of the area of this trapezoid and divide it by the width? I should get the height, right? About. Notice, let me remind you, this is point X, F of X. Let me make this a little bit more precise now. Here I'm assuming. Well, I've written this interval, I'm assuming it's positive, but it doesn't matter. You could do it the other case where it's negative. Why is it continuous? Because F is continuous everywhere on A, A B, so it's continuous on this little sub interval. Right? So, let M be F's minimum value on. X, X plus H, and M, the F's maximum value. Because we know that a continuous function, a closed interval, has a max angle. Right, so that's very useful for us. What do I know? I know that the interval from x to x plus h of f to t to t is between two things. It's maximum value times the length of the interval, because that's a big rectangle. Maximum value times the length of the interval, which is h. And it's also greater than or equal to its minimum value. Its minimum value comes along with it. Because capital MH is a rectangle that's over the top of this, and little MH is a rectangle that's sort of under it. Divide both sides by, or divide all three sides by H. Again, I'm assuming that H is positive here, but we'll work it out for H. Negative twelve. As H goes to zero, both M 
and capital M go to f of x. Because as h gets smaller and smaller, imagine it getting smaller and smaller, its minimum and maximum values get closer to f of x. Remember the black line, the black vertical line here on the left is static. And it's sliding in this way. So f of x, the minimum and maximum values are getting closer to f of x. So if I squeeze, limit as h goes to zero, Both of these going to f of x, and this is squeezed in the middle. All right, so squeeze there and gives us this. So, back to this here. Now we know that this thing is going to so. Here's an area, a net area function of this crazy term, t squared sine of t squared. It's derivative, fundamental theorem of calculus is x squared sine of x squared. What about this one? What if I did this? What what's the what's the change up in this one? Well no, there's something else here. The variable x is now the bottom. How can we fix that? Now, this is where you want it initially minus the square root of x squared plus one. Okay. This. Okay, now I've got variables on both the top and the bottom, which is not this, and not this. Let me write this way.
my choice of choosing zero is to go to our Any questions? One more cross match. Still one thing that's got to be followed. How do I deal with the fact that this is an X square over two X? This is an X, this is an X, this is an X square over two X. This is just like a new formula. It's just like learning something new, like art tangent or something like that. But it was so you've got a new formula. How do we apply this? What we have is we have a of x squared by the department. So this should be e to the minus x squared squared using our new formula. But I'm not done. What do I got to do? I've got to multiply by the derivative of what's inside. What's the derivative of x squared? Same deal here. This is e minus 2x squared times the derivative of 2x. If I clean this up a little bit, 2x e to the minus x4 minus 2e minus 4x squared. From this, let me give you a formula <laughs> that you're welcome to memorize or whatever. See if you can verify this. This is just a chain of just like the problem. If R of X and S of X are differential and F of X is continuous and Capital X of X is the input of R of X and S of X. Then what is the Then F prime of X is little f of S of X, S prime of X, uh, minus little m R of X. And that's exactly that's what we did out long. So we had another example. Now it has is the interval to square subject of a cube root of t5 plus t1 t one five personal favorite functions. Then f prime of x is plug in the top. So it's the cube root of plug in e x squared. So that's going to be e to the 5 
five x squared uh, plus e to the x squared one times the derivative of e to the x squared, which is e to the x squared times two x minus plug in the bottom u root of sine x plus sine x plus one times the derivative of the bottom of in this case sine x Okay, so remember that in the next couple of days, I'm sure we're going to ask some derivatives on that. Um, from this, we get the famous. There's only one single unknown theorem calculus function. Suppose that f is continuous. And Axel's uh, theorem is true in more generality than this. And F of X is any anti of uh, little F of X on the symbol. Then, and this isn't a the theorem, folks, this is a comparison. Boxes are no longer necessary. We have something much more than this. Uh, to do this problem. This is the one we set up the boxes. This was that nightmare that did the beginning of the class with the cosine and all the pretty stuff. But this is reduced to a much easier thing. One caveat. So, for example, This problem, I had set up boxes and I had some crazy, crazy trig identity. Here's how easy to come to know John. What is your favorite antiderivative cosine of x? Sine x, anything. And in fact, the thumbnail says you can use anything to derive this cosine x. So you could use sine x plus 1 or sine x minus 17. I would prefer sine x. It's easier. Evaluate this from here to here, so that's sine a minus sine zero. And sine zero is zero, so it's sine a. There you go. Just like that. Here is an easier example that we did earlier. Uh, Four times two x, and again I set this up drawing pictures of it, uh, and I assumed that it was positive. This doesn't even matter. My favorite antiderivative of this is four uh, four x minus x squared evaluated when I'm zero to a. So this is four a minus a squared minus zero. 4a minus We're doing the problem to boost it. Now, here's the one caveat. You gotta be able to find that antiderivative. 
if he can, then you reduce oftentimes just the cost. Of it. Uh, for example, the one that I gave you earlier, if I want to do this, This one, an antiderivative, cannot be written down in terms of relative components. That doesn't mean you can't do this problem. You can't. But you just can't get it in close form. You need to approximate the area of your curve using boxes and poking into boxes to approximate. And these numerical values are made from computing various probabilities. With a lot of functions, especially what you start off with, you'll be able to find antiderivatives. And of course, because of this theorem, this theorem is so fundamental and it so makes everything easier if you can find the antiderivative. This is a big part of 1080 is devoted to techniques of finding that antiderivative. Right? So we've already seen some antiderivatives. The antiderivative cosine is sine, the antiderivative of sine minus cosine. But there are ones that are harder to see. The antiderivative of tangent is nice water to see. And under the secret of natural log, absolute value secret uh, plus tangent. These are harder to see, and that's why, because of the importance of the serum, that's why a big chunk of 1080 is devoted to uh, figuring out antiderivatives. I'm going to show uh, why this one is true as well. And this one's quick. Would you, would you recommend, like, uh, maybe a modest case of function? I, I, I know cosine and sine. Uh, if you're doing enough problems, this will be more important than 1080. And if you're doing enough problems, you'll probably start to remember. Uh, if I was warming up for the test and I hadn't done enough homework problems, I probably would remember the antiderivative tangents and things like that just to keep saying just to make it quicker. Um, so, okay, so I'm going to prove that this is true. Let f of x be the integral from a to x to f of t to t, where x is put here. So I'm just drawing my little area by doing a to b. And I've got this little function here, my area function. It goes through here. This is F of X. Note F prime of X is equal to F of X by fundamental theorem of calculus plus one. So in other words, F is an antiderivative. Notice that uh, the integral, uh, well, I'll do this. Notice that f of b minus f of a, the integral from a to b, f of t, minus the integral from a to a. Because f of b is this thing, because all I'm doing is plugging in b for x. b is this thing, f of a is this thing, I'm plugging in a for x. And this, of course, is zero. So what we've shown is this integral is equal to f of b minus f of a, where I'll pick this antiderivative. Now, what the fundamental theorem of Calvin says is any antiderivative. If g of x is another antiderivative, of f of x on a, b, 
what can you say about the relationship between g of x and f of x? Two antiderivatives don't have to be the same, but what? They must differ by one. Think of this way. What's an antiderivative of two x? Great. What's another antiderivative of two x? Okay, there you go. So any any answer, any two of you given, the difference between them is constant. Great. This was the mean values pair. So any antiderivative must vary from that antiderivative to both dominants. And if you look at g of b minus g of a, this is f of b plus c minus f of a plus c. The c's cancel out, and this is f of b minus f of a, which we've already shown is the integral from a to b. And there you go. So the fundamental theorem of calculus holds for any antiderivative. Okay, any questions? So this makes our life easier. Um, but so. I'm going to ask you to do some rules today, and for some of you, the fundamental theorem of calculus, but keep your eyes on it. Uh, do it any way that you want. Uh, I really like to throw the point of town just like this, instead of making a bunch of boxes. So it might be convenient to make it like this. What's the antiderivative of t to the minus two? There you go, uh, close. T to the minus one over the minus one. So it's not good. How about the uh, antiderivative of T to the minus one, one over T? It's natural log. It's It's actually the natural log of the absolute value of t is the better form. What in the, put the absolute value here? Why does it not matter? It's good. That's right. We're, 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 we're living in the positive world. How about t to one half? And the room bad. Uh, well, just what you do is you kick up the power. The, the power has to be three halves, right? Because when you take the root, you've got to get back to one half power. But that's not going to be right quite because I'm going to have three halves to get one half. Look at that. Yeah. 
The good thing about antiderivatives is this. Sometimes they're hard to find out, but when you're, especially when you've got time on your hands, like you did in homework study, you can always check. Right? In any of these, if you take the derivative, you get back where you started, you're right. How about five? Five. Evaluate 0.3. So I'll put in three first. Minus third plus log three plus two thirds three. Let me add up. Plus 15. Minus. Put one. We get minus one plus log, log of one to zero plus two thirds plus five. I will think so. Log of eight minus fifteen plus two thirds. Uh, right again, that's 15 minus 4 to 11. Here's another um yes. As time goes by, how far uh, is box travel? Can somebody tell what the displacement is? What's the difference between these two questions? I asked first one. What's the displacement as uh, time goes from zero to four? And then um, how far did the uh, go? What's the difference between displacement? How far is Right, so the displacement is, is sort of like just to measure where you end up. So imagine just for a second, I'm going to simplify the world here. Say the world is this. Suppose you start here. You walk all the way around the world. All the way around the world. So you start there and you end up. What's your displacement? Zero. 
start him in the same place. Now, of course, if I looked at you and said you wasn't the person from the God, you were, you'd get quite angry with me because you walked all the way around the world, right? So, you know, I drive to work every day when I have my displacement from morning to when I come home at night is zero. My odometer tells me something else, right? So how would I figure out uh, this versus this? Well, number one, my displacement is S of four minus S of zero, right? So this is your position. This is your position at time four, and this is your position at time zero. That difference tells you how far you've gone. Agree? This is the interval from zero to four, B of T to T. Because my favorite antiderivative, B of T, is S of T. Right? Because the derivative of the position of velocity and S of 4 minus S of 0, this is basically the fundamental theory of calculus. So to do this first problem, all I have to do is figure this out. This is what? 4 minus 2t. And 0 to 4, so I get 4t minus t squared. So I get 16 minus 16. Minus zero minus zero and zero. So it's the situation here. My displacement is zero. So wherever I started is where I ended up. How do you think anybody anybody got a recipe for, for reading the odometer? Right, it's like a total area. So I can get away with this a nice formula. It should be that. Because how did you end up, how, how do I ever end up back where I started? Well, here, I started here, here I go, we're positive. For me, to end up back where I start, I've got to go some negative to undo it, right? This basically measures your, sp your speed, right? So your odometer doesn't care when you're going east or west, it always measures things positive, right? Your odometer doesn't know what direction you're going, it just always measures things positive. That's what this is for. It's the absolute value. So, huh, how, how are we going to do this? Well, this one will require me to actually look at this function. Let's see what B of T looks like. Oops. This. So it comes negative right here, right? As you pass through two. So to do this problem, how far did my rocket travel? Okay, of course I can do this. The interval from zero to two plus the interval from two to four is the interval from zero to one. Why did I choose to break it up this way? So this is where V of T is positive, and this is where V of T is negative, right? This is, if you look at the graph, that's where it goes under the x axis. So, this is the interval from 0 to 2 
of just VT plus the integral from two to four of negative VT. Why negative? Because I have to change the sign because it's negative. So this is the integral from zero to two of four minus two t plus the integral from two to four of two t minus four. You know, and it's actually a good gut check because both of these separate answers should give you a positive. That's kind of a, a, a good sort of gut check to at least hint to you that you're on the answer. So let's look at the first one first. Uh, I'll do this separately. Four minus two t dt is four t minus t squared evaluated from zero to two, which is eight minus four. Which is and if I look at the interval from two to four of two t minus four, so the piece right here. This is t squared minus 4t, evaluated from 2 to 4, so that's 16 minus 16 minus, when I put in 2 here, I get 4 minus 8, so I get a grand total of positive 4, also. So here, I get 4 plus 4. So whatever my appropriate units are, I'm going to take them. Okay. Any I, I'm going to give you these facts here. It's more likely when you get used of to do like magic proofs or do some desire. But here's another. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but actually, Okay. How oh, do we do this problem? I mean, good luck finding an anti. Anybody know what an anti derivative of x squared plus sine squared x sine of two x and the x squared plus the square of x cubed is equal to one? Surely that's another one of the questions we could have later. But nonetheless, I mean, that makes sense. It's odd 
How many of you have seen the concept of the world? Anybody name an example of the new construction? Yes. The right side, y axis. Kind of area. Basically, this side is just spinning the side. And that's what this means f of minus x and f of x have the same y form. Y coordinate minus x and x are the same. That's why this is looked like. You might name some examples of even functions. Good. Absolute value of x, x squared, cosine of x. These are all examples. What is odd? I think it's hard for me. Uh, but I'll do it. Now that I think it's a good thing. So, so basically, what you do is you turn this around and flip it. All right, so you take the Take the right side and invert it up this and flip it over here. And notice that the y coordinate at x and the y coordinate at negative x are on the same side. Uh, can you name some odd functions? Now, let me ask you a question here. What happens if you integrate? If I've drawn this better, what happens if you integrate an odd function? Because uh, basically, this property here guarantees the sign that areas cancel out. Now, you got to have two things going on. You got to have it odd, and you got to have it on a symmetric interval. Whatever here and here and here on the sign. Otherwise, if I change this problem from negative two to three or negative three to four, I'm totally hosed. I, I'm just going to have to be positive. Now, why is this an odd function? What are those? Sign. If you look at f minus x, it's minus x squared. Cosine squared minus x uh, times sine minus x cubed. I'm going to write this equation for my purposes. E minus x squared times minus x four 
plus minus an x squared plus one. Which in this case is equal to, that's x squared, that's uh, cosine squared of x, because cosine is an easy function. So cosine minus x is cosine x. Is this is minus sine x one of the q, because sine is odd function. e to the x squared, square root of x4 plus x squared plus one. All the minuses here are gone because the powers of x are even. And if we take just one more step, this is going to be minus uh, well, I'll make it this is going to be x squared cosine squared x minus 1 cubed sine cubed x over e to the x squared x over plus x squared plus 1 and minus one cubes minus, so minus x squared plus x squared x sine cube x minus the f of x. So f of x will odd integral to minus three three. You might ask yourself, so I'll kind of leave you with this, I guess, in place. What if you have an eight? Suppose f of x is even. Well, this isn't going to be zero. I mean, you can see that very plainly. Do you think you're short of that? You see some symmetry there? It should be the total area on the curve should be twice this. So this is a shortcut that's all we use. Zero to A. Okay. Any questions? Well, without any further ado, we'll take our quiz.